Hi there, it's me again, John, and thank you for joining me today. And for this clip, we will talk about arterial blood gas analysis, or your ABG. Your ABG is a test that will evaluate adequacy of perfusion in the body. It's so powerful in any clinical setup because it will somehow give you an idea what specific metabolic or respiratory disorder or condition the patient is experiencing. How? By looking at patient's blood pH, the partial carbon dioxide pressure, the partial oxygen pressure, and the bicarbonate level in the patient's blood. Now, this is a test that uses an arterial blood specimen. That is why the moment you have your specimen with you, okay, it must be sent immediately okay, without delay to the laboratory for evaluation because any delay with the test will also affect ABG result. Apart from that, another thing that may cause alteration in the result of the ABG of the patient is that if your patient from the time you extract blood, patient is using or receiving o any O2 supplementation. May it be a low oxygen flow rate or high oxygen flow rate. That is why you need to stay, you need to identify there. You have to identify and inform that, that during blood extraction for ABG, patient is receiving O2 supplementation because it will also affect the ABG result of the patient. Apart from that, another thing that will also affect the ABG result will be if there's too much heparin in the syringe. Now, some countries, they have limitation with the heparinized syringe. Okay, one good example is that I experienced this in the Philippines. Since we don't have much heparinized syringe, sometimes we turn an ordinary syringe to become heparinized. If there's too much heparin incorporated in the syringe, chances are it will also affect the ABG result of your patient. Okay, so I mentioned there are four common values, things to remember when we talk about ABG. A, B, G, or arterial blood gases. Okay, first will be the pH. Okay, your pH stands for potential hydrogen or your power of hydrogen. The pH reflects acidity or alkalinity of a substance, solution, or surface. If there's an increase in the pH or high pH, we call that a sure alkalosis. Okay, if there is a decrease in the pH or low pH, we call that a sure acidosis. In the hospital, we don't refer, we don't tell the doctor, doctor is a high pH or doctor there is a low pH. We use the terminologies acidosis and alkalosis. So again, alkalosis is increased pH. Acidosis decreased pH. So the question here is what is normal blood pH? The normal blood pH ranges from 7.35 to 7.45. Okay, so the normal is 7.35 to 7.45. Please be reminded, okay, please be reminded that the mean is 7.40. Okay? The mean is 7.40. Normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. The mean is 7.40. Why do I okay, why do I keep on saying the mean is 7.40? Because this 7.40 is so helpful later on to identify with a type of full compensation. Because sometimes in your examination, you will encounter fully compensated respite, fully compensated metabolic. So this mean will give you an idea whether that full compensation is respiratory in nature or metabolic in nature. But we know for the fact that the normal pH ranges from 7.35 to 7.45, okay? Next is your partial oxygen pressure partial oxygen pressure. Please do not confuse yourself with the O2 saturation. In your O2 saturation, we use a pulse oximeter. And the unit used in your O2 saturation is percentage, correct? In your ABG, we don't use the O2 saturation. We use the partial oxygen pressure. And the unit used here is not percentage. Instead, it's millimeters mercury. So the normal partial oxygen pressure ranges from 85 to 100, okay? Normal is 85 to 100 millimeters mercury. 85 to 100 millimeters mercury. Next is your partial carbon dioxide pressure. Normal partial carbon dioxide pressure ranges from 35 to 45 millimeters mercury. Again, partial carbon dioxide pressure ranges from 35 to 45 millimeters mercury. And last is your bicarbonate, this is your HCO3. Your bicarbonate is actually produced by the kidneys and bicarbs is actually part of the buffer system. 
The very nature of your bicarb is that it is a form of an alkaline. Therefore, if it is alkaline, it neutralizes acidity. So you have an idea that bicarb is alkaline. So too much bicarb can cause alkalosis. Am I right? So if you don't have bicarb at all, nobody now will neutralize acidity. So that is why patient will end up having acidosis if you don't have bicarb. Okay? So the normal bicarbonate ranges from 22 to 26 milli equivalent per liter. It's 22 to 26 milli equivalent per liter. So these are values you need to remember, you need to store in your brain. If you will encounter ABG, you will use this in your examination, okay? So you have your pH, PCO2, PO2, and your bicarbonate. So what I'm going to do now is we will discuss them one by one and things to remember in your examination, okay? So put an asterisk below, right there, nursing alert. What are the things you need to remember when you talk about ABG analysis? Now, before you extract blood from your patient for ABG analysis, there is a specific test you need to perform, and that is what we call your Allen's test, okay? So you need to perform an Allen's test. Allen's test. But don't worry, I will show a video file later on how Allen's test is being performed. Thing to remember with your Allen's test is that it is a test that evaluates collateral circulation of the, okay, of the vessel, okay, particularly your artery. So what common ves okay, vessels or arteries are being used in your ABG? You can use the arterial line here in your radial. You also have here the ulnar artery. You also have the brachial artery, okay? So initially, what we use is the radial artery, okay? So again, the Allen's test is a test that evaluates collateral circulation of the blood vessel. What do you mean by that? Remember, in your ABG analysis, you need to extract blood from arterial line. So if you're going to puncture the arterial line, remember the blood flow in an artery is away from the heart. It supplies blood distal or away from the heart. Supplies tissues there, supplies blood vessel, supplies cells or tissues away from the heart. Therefore, if you puncture the arterial line and that causes injury, and what eventually circulation is disrupted. That is why you need to check collateral circulation of other key artery. If this artery is occluded, can other artery supply? Can other artery compensate if the other artery is occluded or destroyed? That is the purpose of your Allen's test, to evaluate collateral circulation, okay? Again, I said there will be a video file shown at the end of this clip for you to okay, for you to appreciate and somehow learn how Allen, Allen's test is being performed. Okay, next, number two. Let's talk about pH this time. Remember I said pH or potential hydrogen or power of hydrogen. I said an increase in the pH is alkalosis, a decrease in the pH is acidosis, correct? I hope you remember that. So an increase in the pH is alkalosis, a decrease in the pH is acidosis. Now, there are two systems in the body that will regulate pH balance. Again, there are two systems in the body that will regulate pH. First is your respiratory system, and the second system will be urinary or your renal system. Don't forget this. These are the two systems that will affect or regulate pH, the respiratory and the urinary, or you call that your renal system. Always remember that if a patient has a pulmonary problem, pulmonary disorders, respiratory disorders, definitely it affects respiratory. Am I right? It affects respiratory status, the pulmonary status. But if a patient has a urologic disorder or renal disorder, the effect will be metabolic. Okay, the effect will be metabolic effect. Okay, do not forget that. And since these two systems, okay, these two systems will regulate pH, it follows that these two systems will work hand in hand. They try to compensate. That is why if a patient has a pulmonary problem, respiratory problem, respiratory in origin, respiratory disorder, okay, your renal or metabolic will compensate. Okay, but if you have a metabolic problem, urologic disturbances, Okay, renal disturbances, your pulmonary system will compensate. These two systems, they work hand in hand. They compensate, they complement each other. Okay, so that is your pH. Next, number three, is your partial oxygen pressure. Now, what do you call that state or condition if there's too much oxygen? Of course, you call that as your hyperoxemia. A decrease in oxygen, a decrease a decrease of oxygen level in the blood, we call that as your hypoxemia, okay? 
So again, increase in your partial oxygen and a decrease in your partial oxygen. Again, an increase in the partial oxygen, we call that as your hyperoxemia. Hyperoxemia. Remember, hyper is increased oxy, that's your blood, emia, that's okay, sorry, oxy is your oxygen, emia, that's your blood. So hyperoxemia, increased oxygen in the blood. A decrease in the oxygen in the blood is what we call hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is decreased oxygen in the blood. That makes it different from hypoxia. What is the difference between hypoxia and hypoxemia? Hypoxemia is decreased oxygen in the blood. Hypoxia is decreased oxygen in the cells or tissues. Okay? So hypoxia refers to the cells, refers to the tissues that, has, that they have a low oxygen content. But hypoxemia refers to decreased oxygen in the blood. I hope that makes sense. Next. Number four. Okay, will be your partial carbon dioxide pressure. Again, normal, I said 35 to 45. What do you call that state or condition when there's too much carbon dioxide level? Okay, if there's too much carbon dioxide level, sorry. If there's too much carbon dioxide, you call that condition as your hyperpapnia. Hyperpapnia. A decrease in your partial carbon dioxide pressure, you call that as your hypocapnia okay so if you're hypercapnia there's too much carbon dioxide hypocapnia okay there's decreased carbon dioxide level okay next number five it's sure bicarbonate remember i said bicarb is part of the buffer system and bicarb its nature it's alkaline correct and i said if it is alkaline what is the effect it neutralizes acidity Next, another thing to remember in your exam, we need to talk about ABG. Now, there is such thing as what we call hyperventilation, hypoventilation, vomiting, diarrhea, correct? So let's discuss them one by one and their effects to your ABG. Let's begin with your hyperventilation. Okay, hyperventilation. When patient hyperventilates, <laughs> when the patient hyper hyperventilates, maybe due to anxiety, maybe related because patient is in pain, or patient has fever, or patient has CNS infections, or patient ingested toxic substances, they will induce hyperventilation. So the effect there is that when you hyperventilate, that increases carbon dioxide loss. So if there's carbon dioxide loss, okay, carbon dioxide loss what will happen is that decreases carbon dioxide level in the blood. We call that condition a short hypocapnia. Therefore, when you hyperventilate, okay, you, when you hyperventilate, okay, there's too much carbon dioxide being eliminated. As a result, carbon dioxide in the body decreases. You call that condition a short hypocapnia. What will happen now if you have hypocapnia? Remember, the relationship of carbon dioxide and pH, these two are inversely proportional. In short, if there's a decrease in carbon dioxide, that increases your pH, causing alkalosis. So don't forget, when patient hyperventilates, okay, patient will end up having respiratory alkalosis. Why respiratory? Because hyperventilation is pulmonary in nature, respiratory in nature. So that makes it respiratory alkalosis. So patient will have respiratory alkalosis. So don't forget this. A decrease in the carbon dioxide will increase the pH, causing respiratory alkalosis. Now in your examination, when patient develops hyperventilation, since I mentioned that this condition will cause a decrease in the carbon dioxide, your primary goal there is to restore carbon dioxide level, right? You have to bring back the carbon dioxide that the patient, what? Eliminated, okay? So that is why our actions here, okay? Our actions here is to tell the patient to breathe, okay? Breathe in a cup hands or a brown paper bag, okay? Tell the patient to breathe using your cup hands, or using your brown paper bag. Long time ago, the answer there is brown paper bag. It's an old answer. 
Okay, the new answer now is you, you have the patient breathe through your cup hands, okay? The same, the, the same principle. Breathing through your cup hands, breathing to a brown paper bag will restore carbon dioxide level. So the reason why you do this, the reason why you instruct the patient to do this is to restore carbon dioxide because in hyperventilation, there is hypocapnia. So you have to bring it back, okay? Another thing to remember in your examination. When you hyperventilate, especially if it is on the first 24 hours, this is beneficial for a patient with increased ICP, okay? So this is good, good for patient with increased ICP. Now, why is it important for us on the first 24 hours of a patient with increased intracranial pressure to induce hyperventilation? Because I said hyperventilation okay, can cause hypocapnia. Why? Look at the effects look at the effects of decreased carbon dioxide. If there's a decreased carbon dioxide in the body, the blood vessels in the peripheral area will constrict. The blood vessels in the brain will constrict, but the blood vessels in, okay, in the pulmonary area will dilate. So again, effects of hypocapnia or effects of hyperventilation that leading to hypocapnia. Effects of hypocapnia are the following. Patient will end up having peripheral vasoconstriction. In short, the blood vessels in the peripheral area will constrict, okay? What else? Patient will have cerebral vasoconstriction. In short, the blood vessels in the brain will constrict, okay? But the blood vessels in the pulmonary area will dilate. So this will lead to pulmonary vasodilation going back to the key going back to what we call patient with increased icp how will this k do good to patient with increased icp now if you can still remember in your neurology concept in your anatomy physiology of the nervous system when you talk about intracranial pressure or icp by the way the normal icp is less than 15 millimeters mercury right less than 15 millimeters mercury. There are three common elements or factors that will affect intracranial pressure or ICP. First is what they call the CSF volume or the cere cerebrospinal fluid. If there is an increase in the CSF, just like for a patient with hydrocephalus, there will be an increase in the ICP. By the way, the normal CSF volume ranges from 100 to 150 ml, okay? The second element or factor that will affect ICP is the blood volume. So how much blood does the brain have inside? Inside the brain, there is about 150 ml of blood. That is where there's too much blood inside there because of intracranial bleeding, Okay, but will also increase intracranial pressure. So that will give you, okay, that will give you a hint now. When the blood vessels in the brain constrict, less blood goes in, gets inside the brain. A decrease in the brain, okay, in the blood volume that enters the brain will also decrease ICP. That is one that will do good to patient with increased intracranial pressure, especially on the first 24 hours. Okay, let's continue. I said there are three factors. Third and the last factor that will affect ICP is the brain volume. Brain volume is about 1,400 ml. For example, patient develops brain tumor. A tumor is a new growth, right? It's a form of a neoplasm. Therefore, if it's a new growth, no tissue is being formed there. So that is why that will increase the brain volume more than 1.4K. So that will increase ICP of your patient. So again, there are three common elements or factors that will affect intracranial pressure. The CSF volume, the brain volume, and the blood volume. But don't worry because any if, any abnormalities in any of this element, the other element or factors will compensate. We call that in your neuro a Monro Kelly hypothesis or Monro Kelly doctrine. Okay? Anyway, let's go back. If you want to know more about that, okay, check my previous video about neurologic disturbances. I, I discussed that in your neuro concept. Now let's go back. So this is what we call effects of okay, decreased carbon dioxide or hypocapnia, which is good to patient with intracranial pressure that is elevated. Okay? Next. Number seven. If there's such thing as hyperventilation, there is also what we call hypoventilation. So when the patient hypoventilates, so you know when you hypoventilate, carbon dioxide in the body retains. Am I right? So hypoventilation will result to decrease carbon dioxide elimination. 
So that carbon dioxide gas cannot be eliminated, resulting to accumulation or retention in the body. So decreased carbon dioxide elimination will increase carbon dioxide level. We call that a short hypercapnia. So hypercapnia, too much carbon dioxide. So what will happen to your pH? The pH, I said, they are both okay, inversely proportional. An increase in the carbon dioxide will decrease the pH. And what did it tell you about decreased pH? We call that acidosis. So that is why when you hypoventilate, patient will end up having respiratory acidosis. So this will result to respiratory acidosis. Why did a patient hypoventilate? There's a lot of factors or reasons why patient hypoventilate. Most probably because of brain injury. Most probably because of depression or trauma in the medulla oblongata. Remember, the medulla oblongata is the respiratory center. Any depression there, okay, any injury there or depression because overdosage of your morphine, okay, can cause depression so patient will hypoventilate. What else? Another reason why patient hypoventilate may be related to spinal cord injury or a patient with um, patient with stroke or a patient with neuromuscular disturbances just like your uh, just like your Parkinson's disease, just like your um, myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, your ALS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, or your Lou Gehrig's disease. These disorders are neuromuscular. They will end up, if not treated, they will end up having pulmonary or respiratory failure. And by the way, that's the most common cause of death okay, of those diseases I mentioned a while ago. Okay? So this is your hypoventilation. So if patient hypoventilate, Okay, if patient hypoventilates, we know that hypoventilation can cause carbon dioxide retention. Will you tell the patient to breathe in a cup, hands, or brown paper bag? No, because the more it increases carbon dioxide level. So your action here is directed to promote carbon dioxide elimination. So what will be your nursing instruction? What will you, okay, what will you tell your patient? You tell your patient to do first sleep method of breathing. Okay, tell the patient to do first lip breathing okay so when you say first lip breathing which is longer inhalation or exhalation of course it's exhalation okay in your first lip breathing it's just like blowing a candle when you blow a candle okay it has a longer exhalation so longer exhalation your first lip method of breathing will promote carbon dioxide loss okay so again the purpose in doing cup hands, breathing through your cup hands or brown paper bag is to restore carbon dioxide level. The purpose of your first lip breathing is to promote carbon dioxide loss. Because remember, these two conditions are opposite. Okay? Please do not forget this. Next, number eight. I mentioned a while ago vomiting. Now, what goes with vomiting will be frequent gastric suctioning. Frequent gastric suctioning. Now remember, in our stomach, there's such thing as what we call hydrochloric acid. So when the patient vomits, okay, when the patient vomits, when you do frequent gastric lavage or gastric suctioning, okay, you're going to lose the gastric content that includes your hydrochloric acid, that includes fluid, that includes electrolytes as well. So apart from having fluid and electrolyte imbalances, when you vomit a lot, you will also end up having electrolyte imbalances and K-acid-based imbalances. How did it happen? Okay, and how will it happen? So a patient who vomits a lot, who frequent gastric suctioning, remember there's increased, increased gastric juice loss, okay? So when I say gastric juice loss, Okay, pay attention with your hydrochloric acid. So therefore, when you lose the hydrochloric acid, what will happen? If you lose hydrochloric acid, that increases your pH, giving you alkalosis because of the fact you just what you just eliminated the acid. So you will end up having metabolic alkalosis. So don't forget this. Metabolic alkalosis, okay, is the effect if you do if you have vomiting or uh, one good example there is for pregnant mothers who have this what we call hyper MSS gravidarum that usually happens in the first trimester of pregnancy. They may end up having metabolic alkalosis if not corrected. Okay? Now, number nine is diarrhea. Diarrhea. 
So when you have diarrhea, there is fluid loss. Am I right? So look, diarrhea will have increased fluid loss or water loss. An increase in the fluid loss will make the hydrogen in the blood concentrated. So that increases hydrogen concentration. Why? Because you just lost fluid. Am I right? That makes the blood concentrated because you are dehydrated. So that will increase hydrogen concentration. If you happen to read or watch my video that I posted about renal dysfunction, renal failure, remember I said that hydrogen and pH are directly proportional. No, inversely proportional. In short, if there's increased hydrogen in the body, okay, that decreases the pH leading to acidosis. Okay, so diarrhea can cause metabolic acidosis because in diarrhea, there is fluid loss. So if, you, if you're dehydrated, that makes the hydrogen in the body concentrated. Now, to make it simple, look at this. So if you're the person, here you are, okay, what did it tell you? An increase in the pH is what they call alkalosis. A decrease in the pH is called acidosis. Am I right? Now look. When you vomit, when you vomit, look at the movement of the vomitus. When you vomit, uh, 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 alkalosis, alkalosis. When you vomit, the vomitus goes up. It goes up. It goes up. The pH goes up. Therefore, when you vomit, look at the direction of the vomitus. It goes up. That causes high pH called alkalosis. But when you have diarrhea, okay, the diarrhea, the fetal material goes down. Diarrhea goes down, the pH goes down, causing acidosis. So somehow that will give you an idea if you get confused with respiratory, with diarrhea and uh, vomiting. Just look at the direction of these two substances, okay? The vomitus and the stool, okay? So diarrhea can cause low pH, that is what's called acidosis, and vomiting can cause high pH, and that is what we call alkalosis, okay? I hope you learned something. So I want you to, okay, we're almost done here. So I want you to watch the Allen's test that will be played after this so that you will have an idea what Allen's test is all about. Then after that, we will talk about, I will teach you how to read ABG if such thing will, okay, will come out in your any qualifying examination. So after this, again, you will, you will watch an Allen's test video. Then I will teach you how to read ABG. Then we'll talk about the disturbances and the management as well. So I hope you learned something, guys, and uh, keep safe, and I hope to see you in the next video clip. Bye.